Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's forum. My name is Bob Turner. I'm the uh, co-founder of the Center for National Security Law at the University of Virginia Law School, and we are co-sponsoring today's program, and it is always a great delight and pleasure to, uh, to join with programs that Yona puts on because they're always excellent. I want to acknowledge as well General Al Gray, former Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, one of my very few true heroes uh, and a, a great American patriot. Uh, I think I'm sort of filling in for him because we weren't sure he was going to be here, and I apologize in advance that you're not hearing him and having to suffer through me. I am reminded of a story they tell about a man called Johnstown Jim. Uh, about 125 years ago, in fact this month, there was a big flood in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and a young man named Jim lived through it and spent much of the rest of his life going around on what we call the rubber chicken circuit, talking to Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs and Boy Scout groups and so forth about his experience. And one day, as all human beings eventually do, he passed away and he went to heaven and St. Peter sort of interviewed him as he was in processing and he said, well, are, do you have any special talents or experiences? And he says, well, you, now that you ask about it, I survived the Johnstown flood. And he said, oh, really? Well, we have a group that gets together every Wednesday at lunchtime, and we have a speaker, and I'm sure they would love to hear your story. And Jim is feeling really good about himself, and he says, well, I'll be happy to do that. And uh, St. Peter introduces him to the group, and St. Peter's walking back off the stage, and he's walking on. St. Peter sort of stops him and says, you see the old greyhound man in the end row there with the beard? Well, that's Noah. <laughs> I, I mention that because when I'm talking about issues of terrorism in the presence of Yona, uh, I feel like I'm in the presence of Noah and I feel very humble. Uh, our topic today is diplomacy and force, rewards, cost, and lessons. Uh, let me start off. I have, like most former military people, a passion for peace and a hatred for war. Well, if we can solve our problems through diplomacy, that is the way to go. But one of the realities in life is when we are dealing with tyrants, dictators, uh, terrorists, and others who have no respect for the rule of law. International law plays no role in keeping the peace unless it is backed up by the threat of force. Perhaps that can be provided by the UN Security Council if we could get Putin and others to stop using their veto. Uh, but in the long run, it has to be individual states who are willing to stand up and say, that is unacceptable behavior. We're not going to allow you to use poison gas against your own people or your neighbors. We're not going to allow you to commit genocide and so forth. I'm reminded of a 1793 letter that Thomas Jefferson, the founder of my university, and I should say that there is a, a penalty if any professor from the University of Virginia who fails to mention Jefferson in remarks of more than three minutes uh, has his salary docked. Uh, but in 1793, Jefferson wrote uh, James Monroe. This is when Jefferson was our first Secretary of State. And he said, I believe that throughout America there has been but a single sentiment on the subject of peace and war, which was in favor of the former. The executive here has cherished it with equal and unanimous desire. We have differed, perhaps, as to the tone of conduct exactly adapted to securing it. And I think that's so insightful. We don't have a lot of people in this country that favor war over peace. We do have people that say being strong and being firm and being known to be, have both the strength and the will to stand up against aggression and other forms of unacceptable illegal conduct uh, allows us to keep the peace. If all we want to do is stand around, hold hands, and sing kumbaya while uh, the tyrants of the world seize their neighbors and so forth, we will find that if international law will have become part of the problem, not part of the solution. And the greatest threat to world peace and our own security come from these non-democratic regimes that have no interest in obeying their treaty obligations, have no affection for the rule of law, save for the reality that uh, if they fail to obey the rules, they may be punished. I come from the school that believes that rational people pursue their perceived self-interest, a fairly fundamental economic principle. And our job as 
people who believe in peace. In my, my last government job, I had the great pleasure of being the first president of the U.S. Institute of Peace that now has that beautiful building over right across from the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I think we need to understand what deterrence is. And deterrence is basically two perceptions, perception of strength or ability and a perception of will. And if you don't have those perceptions, it doesn't matter how many armored divisions, how many uh, nuclear missiles, how, how many uh, green berets, whatever you have, you're not going to deter. Uh, reality is important because it contributes to perceptions, but what matters is what the enemy perceives. The United States for my adult lifetime has been a very strong country. I don't think there's any doubt about our ability to play a role in keeping the peace and enforcing the law. Our problem has been questions about our will. Are we going to give up after a little while? I think 911 occurred in no small part because of Osama bin Laden's perception that we lacked the will if we suffered casualties. He misinterpreted what happened in Beirut. Uh, something, I just met Al just before that happened, the week before that happened, ironically. Uh, and he thought that if he attacked us and destroyed the World Trade Center and other targets, we would fold our tents and go home. We showed to the contrary. But uh, if we don't maintain that world perception that not only America but the world community has both the strength and the will to do what? To do what? To change their perception. Saddam Hussein gets up in the morning and says, I think I want to invade Kuwait. We want his next thought to be, well, if I do that, the UN Security Council will uh, demand that I present myself and show cause why I shouldn't be tried as a war criminal. And if I try to hide in a hole somewhere, the Americans have these dip penetrating uh, uh, bombs that will likely blow me apart if my girlfriend, mistress, whatever, don't, doesn't sell me out. I think I'll play golf today. Uh, and, and deterrence is critical. Uh, the great Sun Tzu, the Chinese military authority, about 25 years, 25,000, 2,500 years ago, I should have notes, said that the, to win 100 battles and 100 victories in 100 battles is not the acme of skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. And a major tool in our toolbox in achieving that is diplomacy. Diplomacy by itself is not going to work against those who don't respect the rule of law. Uh, I think there are a number of things that we are not doing that we should do more. I'd like to see us spend more time, more effort on psychological warfare. I think in a large sense we're involved in a struggle for ideas. And rather than trying to kill every terrorist who joins the other side, I'd like to see us try to change their thinking uh, and get them to perceive that they really are not properly interpreting the Koran. Uh, I think if we can get our Congress to act on a more bipartisan spirit, and I, I, I worked in the Hill for years, and I was the Acting Assistant Secretary of State for Congressional Relations for a while, and I used to think it was Democrats who were partisan. And then they got the White House and the Republicans were every bit as partisan. And, I, and some of the things that have been done in recent years, promoting the, the future of the Republican Party, I think, have, uh, have not promoted the security interest of our country. But I think that's uh, more than enough, so I'm going to turn things over to, to Yona, who is, uh, in reality, my go-to guy in terrorism issues. I've known Yona, I think, since the 1970s, and uh, he was already a, a leading world authority in terrorism, and so I'm going to sit down and learn from Yona and our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, just for the record, we belong to the same mutual adoration club. And uh, as such, I, I would like to call your attention to the book that uh, he has with Professor John Norton Moore, uh, which I, I think is a classic on the legal issues, the struggle against terrorism. Uh, you do have a flyer, so you can look at that. So we really appreciate very much the cooperation um, that you and John Norton Moore provide and, and your center. So thank you uh, again for providing a context for our, our discussion. And obviously we do have the ambassadors of uh, form and also some military people are going to discuss some of these issues. Before I uh, 
introduce the distinguished uh, uh, panel, um, I, I have a few academic footnotes. First of all, I, I would like to, you mentioned the uh, General Gray, uh, right, right here, I, I would like to mention particularly his book, and I know I, I, I feel that in a way I'm trying to embarrass you, General, but please forgive me because I think if we assess uh, now the issue we discussed specifically, uh, the, the, the role of uh, force and diplomacy, but I think we have to, to discuss uh, the role of uh, leadership because it seems to me that there is a collapse, and I don't want to mention specific countries of uh, failed uh, leadership. And John Gray, Gray, of course, taught us for a very long time. Uh, what does it mean to be a true leader? And I would uh, like you to look at, at the book, and those who purchased the book would know that the whatever royalties are generated, uh, they are being provided uh, for the uh, military families and so on. So number one, I would like to thank General Gray for his uh, leadership and uh, chairing uh, the Board of Regents of the Potomac um, Institute and uh, also our other colleagues here from the Potomac uh, Institute and our uh, team on the terrorism issue. Um, Marianne, where are you? Okay, who is uh, responsible for our publications and videos and all that. And Sharon, we are beginning to collect the tribe of uh, summer uh, interns. We have a few now. Um, so here is uh, Sharon. I, I don't know, we have one or two others here to introduce them. Okay, um, now I think I, have an obligation to, to mention the cooperation of other institutions, the International Law Institute, and um, our colleague, uh, Professor Don Wallace, who is uh, traveling, um, and, and so forth, and uh, <coughs> the uh, CEO of the Potomac Institute, uh <coughs> unfortunately, is uh, not, Mike uh, Swetnam is not in uh, today, but uh, we welcome the participants. Uh, we welcome <coughs> the um, representative of the diplomatic uh, community here and the uh, scholars um, and uh, academics who came to discuss with us this uh, issue. Uh, as I said, I, I have a couple of footnotes. One, I think it is an obligation as always. We really have to dedicate our discussion to the victims of uh, terrorism and violence uh, in general, and uh, also to, to honor um, those who protect us, the security forces, uh, obviously including the, the military. This is one of the issues we're going to discuss, the law enforcement as well, and uh, the diplomats. And of course, we know uh, many uh, were killed by the terrorists. The other um, footnote I have is related to the historical lesson. Uh, I think we simply learn from history that we don't learn from history as we know. And in fact, uh, uh, looking at the calendar today, May the 16th, um, it is the 36th uh, anniversary of the assassination of Aldo Moro. Uh, by the Red Brigades, uh, former uh, Prime Minister in the, uh, Italy. And also, if you look at uh, the record, the historical record, and then wonder what kind of lessons did we learn, this is the 33rd also anniversary of the attempted assassination of um, the Pope, Pope John Paul II, by Mahmoud Ali Aja, the Turk. And this brings us to the dark ages of the Cold War, and obviously uh, we see the shadow coming even now, and we'll discuss it today. And also I'd like to mention the assassination of uh, Roger Gandhi uh, by the Tamil Tigers, uh, another uh, prime, prime minister. So uh, if we look at the record, obviously uh, we see many uh, anniversaries 
related to uh, the attacks around the world and what kind of lessons can we learn. Now, um, I would like to, to mention specifically in light of the ceremonies yesterday held in New York of the opening of the Memorial Museum of the 9-11. And this is the third uh, anniversary of the killing of uh, Ben Laden. And I remember, Bob, that we had a seminar about the justification or not related. People raised questions whether we're justified to go and to kill uh, Ben Laden at the time. Now, uh, finally, um, uh, obviously, we are looking academically at the issues for a long time. And in fact, uh, again, about 70 years after the Second World War, we're wondering uh, whether uh, we are beginning a revised uh, Cold War and uh, still we're learning the, the lessons. And uh, obviously we're going to discuss many of these issues um, very soon. Um, I, I would like to just make one comment, um, Bob, on, on this issue of war and peace. Uh, obviously, if you look at the situation of the war and peace, you have the pessimist, you have the uh, optimist. I, I'd like to mention that two weeks ago, uh, we had a seminar um, on the Middle East uh, peace process, the Palestinian Israeli at the International Law Institute. And um, we had the Israeli uh, diplomat who spoke, and we had also the ambassador of the Arab League who came to the meeting, but they were in the same room, but they didn't sit at the same table. But the good news is that I think uh, we brought them together uh, into one room to discuss the possibilities uh, of peace. Now, finally, uh, one more uh, point, I think, uh, in terms of what you said about uh, the uh, issue uh, of, of uh, peace and the roles of diplomacy um, and force. Now, I think the focus that we're trying to have today is how to bridge the gap between what is desirable and what is possible in terms of conflict uh, re resolution. And I, I would agree with you on the personal level and also in terms of uh, looking at the historical record, um, it is very clear that peace is the dream of the wise. And uh, if you look at the uh, literature and the record throughout the ages, we know that wisdom is better than uh, weapons and war and conflict. And uh, we go back to the, the prophets like Isaiah and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, conflict uh, and, and war is the history of humanity. And the means of destruction are expanding by day. Um, if I may, I recall uh, General Matthew Ridgway um, about uh, 60 or 70 years ago, he observed that there is still one more uh, dangerous weapon, and this is man himself. So we have to look at the evil intentions of uh, individuals and groups uh, throughout the world. Now, I, I, I don't want to go into the debate that we had for many decades, what are the causes of conflict, uh, whether it is uh, men or state or the state system, but there, there is no doubt that we have to look at some of the case uh, studies. So we are very fortunate today uh, to have a number of people who will discuss specifically some case studies. And the first one, I'm going to invite Ambassador Timori Jakobsvili, who was the ambassador of Georgia in the United States. He has a very distinguished career as a, a diplomat and a scholar. Uh, is currently a senior transatlantic fellow at the German Mar Marshall 
fund of the United States. And um, I, I asked him to share with us some of his uh, insights into the situation, that particularly um, while we are looking at the ongoing uh, conflict um, <coughs> related uh, to the Ukraine, but uh, the, the experience of Georgia is very critical. Uh, you have in your package there the series of the speakers, so I won't go uh, into it at this point. So I would invite him to open up uh, the discussion from his perspective, and then we're going to follow up with uh, the Ambassador Kaita from Mali. And um, following that, we will have the experience of some of the diplomats. Mr. Ambassador, would you kindly come up here? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander. It's a pleasure to be back in your institute in different incarnation. Uh, you are the, one of the first places that I came to speak as an ambassador, and I'm glad that uh, I can be back. Uh, you may not see the difference because I was candid there, and if I have a now this title retired, I'll stay candid now as well. Um, and actually, that's something very important to underline, that the classical definition of diplomacy or diplomat, uh, if you read um, some textbooks or if you attend any diplomatic training courses, basically says that diplomat is a person who is sent by his country to lie on behalf of his country. Um, or it's a person that can tell you to go to hell in a way that you are actually looking forward to the trip. This is not true anymore. We are operating in a different world where lies and um, uh, spies are not the same as they used to be. This is a different world in many uh, sense, and I'll go back to that. But before that, I want to mention that uh, it's a very timely event. And uh, what makes it very timely is that we kind of woke up probably a month ago in a completely different world that we are not yet fully realizing it. A world that we knew uh, after collapse of uh, Soviet Union and end of the Cold War is over. Uh, we had relatively peaceful 20, 22 years, I must say. Uh, yes, we had the war on terror, which still continues. We'll be always there. Yes, we had events like Arab Springs. Yes, we had some you know, attempts of war here and there. We had some conflicts in Yugoslavia, very tragic ones. We had um, African conflicts, and et cetera, and et cetera. But none of these conflicts changed the basic realities, and none of them actually challenged basic realities of post-Cold War. What uh, has changed these realities, what was attempted by Saddam Hussein, who invaded Kuwait and was punished for that, what has changed was Russian annexation of Crimea. This is the first time since Saddam Hussein tried and was punished for that, that borders of the country were changed forcefully. And we are not playing here a so-called independence game like legitimate or illegitimate. There were a number of cases of uh, uh, legitimate separation and secessionism. Uh, I mean, um, Czechoslovakia used to be the country. Now we have a Czech uh, Republic in Slovakia. You know, Eritrea uh, story, South Sudan, successful, unsuccessful, we can debate, but still pretty much a uh, you know, legally happening process. We had the Kosovo, still controversial, but it's um, a very unique case anyway. We also have seen uh, so-called mocked or um, fake succession, secessionist movements uh, like Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, um, and many other places. So that was a kind of a game that was still fitting under some sort of international law. And now we are seeing the basic challenge to international law when one country goes 
occupies and annex territory of other country. This is basically undermining uh, the liberal world order. And I'm underlining the word liberal because if it's illiberal, you know, we, we've seen it. We can read about it. And it's happening on the background where that perception, as our previous speaker was talking, are very much changing and shifting, and unfortunately not in a positive direction for the freedom-loving or democracy-loving people. Now we have much more challenges that we used to have. I mean, this correlation of diplomacy and power, the hard power, was always there. We know that these are twin sisters or twin brothers. There is a time for military action and there is time for negotiation. Last time I was negotiating with the Russian generals, our conversation ended very simply. We kind of agreed that um, you know, sooner or later we are going to start to talk again. So what happens in between? How many people will die in between? That's the task of diplomacy to decrease this time as much as possible. But what are the tools of diplomacy has and what are the tools that military has have? Um, we unfortunately got very comfortable uh, in these last 25 years uh, and started to forget some basics. People started to read more Twitters than reading Thucydides or the uh, you know, Sun Tzu. Uh, and uh, you know, Probably we should go back to origins of uh, everything and discover that nothing is new happening in the w this world. We uh, were fascinated by the idea of soft power, like soft power can exist without hard power. Now we are uh, recalibrating, calling smart power. That's even something more bizarre for me. Uh, and um, Warfare, of course, develops. I mean, technology develops and then it um, develops the warfare as well. So you can talk about network-centric, asymmetric, out of area, and now we are uh, seeing the new definitions uh, like uh, hybrid warfare. That's probably what we see now in Ukraine. But um, it's not changing the essence what the war is for and what the, those who are fighting this way or that way are trying to achieve. But where we see the erosion or e enormous shifts is in diplomacy. And look, I mean, we kind of believe that diplomacy is an attribute of independent country or state. You need a state. The state has a diplomatic corps. They have ambassadors, they have negotiators, they have dispatched envoys. Uh, who is negotiating if there is no state? Who is negotiating if it's a failed state? Who is negotiating if it's non-state actor? And we've seen this non-state actor, same Al-Qaeda, same all uh, other organizations. Can you really negotiate with organization that is called terrorist? who don't care about their lives and other lives uh, even more? Can you really negotiate with them? Can you negotiate with countries that understand only zero-sum games and the entire concept of win-win doesn't even exist for them? And more than that, who are the diplomats today? In some countries, I may argue, uh, Officer of uh, World Bank is more important than any senior diplomat of any country. Or country representative of British Petroleum is more powerful than any ambassador. Can you tell me what is doing a uh, French ambassador to Brussels? What is that they are talking about? Because you have a European Union, most of their things are decided in within the European Union, and then you have almost on a daily basis there, let's say, ministers of agriculture negotiating whatever they need to negotiate. What is there left for those diplomats to do there? Take Washington. When I came here 
first thing that I instructed my people, I said, I don't want to see you in office, okay? You are not, we are not a office that is writing the secret cables. What secrets are you going to write? Everything that will happen, the capital will know before us because we are sleeping here and they will uh, wake up and turn on the CNN and will know immediately. Do you really think that we have to translate into our language the New York Times? They can read New York Times, you know, uh, online. You think we have to report about um, meetings at the think tanks? I mean, it's podcasted. I mean, it's on internet. It's on YouTube. So government is not paying your salaries to come in U.S. and do something that you can do back home. So the task of diplomacy is completely shifted. But they cannot talk to congressmen from there. They cannot talk to senators or staffers. They cannot talk to you know, government officials in varieties of offices, off the record, on the record. You cannot take them for the lunch or dinner. And you cannot kind of convince them on your part of the story. And those who live in Washington know very well that diplomacy is mostly about what is the story that you are selling? What's your narrative? And most of the countries actually fail to create narrative that can resonate in the United States. So diplomats became salesmen and saleswomen who are selling narratives more than negotiating. And negotiations y are attributes to international organizations, mostly. And we've seen that every attempt of negotiations are not in the hands of direct diplomatic services, but are more attributes of diplomats again, but in international organization. In Switzerland, in uh, Vienna, in, uh, I don't know, any other places. You have a sweet talking people. In the same time, you also have a faked achievements, uh, which I call, um, you know, linguistic acrobatics. People start to believe that if you will put the nice words in a final document, which will say basically nothing uh, and will result into nothing, you are going to change the reality. Unfortunately, you have a president who believes in that. Unfortunately, your president believes that if he will say something, it automatically will happen. It used to be the case. If American president is saying Assad should go, I expect that Assad will be gone probably maximum three months, two years. He is now re-elected or will be re-elected. When you say it's a red line and the red line is crossed, you cannot talk about pink lines. Because that's, again, going back to perceptions. That's going back to what is the world that we are operating. And in this new world that we will be operating from now, diplomacy, again, will change each, uh, its uh, tactics. And now we see that these negotiations, this um, storytelling, and this... Um, kind of whatever we call in general world diplomacy is no longer only business of one particular department or ministry. Because you will see militaries negotiating with militaries without ambassadors or diplomats. Um, ministries of finance will negotiate their own things without you. Diplomatic pouch is a kind of rudimental something unless you want to send uh, the, you know, s something uh, to your family or receive some smuggled good like Cuban cigars. Uh, and we kind of still operate under the old assumptions. And new assumptions probably have to be now more institutionalized in order to have a successful continuation. If we still assume that there is a liberal world order, it's not, unless Russia is 
withdrawing from Crimea. There is no order. If we believe that the Russians will stop there or Chinese will not attempt something else on any other nations, we'll be wrong. And it's very wrong to say that every option is on the table but a military intervention. You never say that because you are undermining your militaries and primarily you are undermining your diplomats. You cannot send your diplomats to negotiate if they don't have an option, a credible threat. Otherwise, this is coming back to linguistic exercises. Sorry, I'm a bit critical because we've seen it in my country, happening in 2008. And lessons that we've learned, and I was a chief negotiator, by the way, it doesn't matter how much you negotiate. What matters is that what stands behind you. And if the liberal world order will be that easily violated and left unpunished, then we are entering the new era of chaos. And the new era of chaos, there is no magical stick for diplomats to make any difference. And then we'll be going back to go-ho guys and asking them and begging them to do something. And my professor at Yale University told me once something that I never understood then. He said, you have to remember that peace is abnormal for humanities. War is normal. So if you are living in peace for a long while, you start to appreciate more, not take it granted. And this duo of diplomacy and hard power should be working together. And if you are disenfranchised, one of them, then your results will be very bad. Either you are projecting weakness and the other party will win, or you will be dragged into the direct military confrontation. So the best success that this country or the liberal world had when this duo was working together, you go to negotiate and you have that you have a back, strong back from your militaries or you don't send your militaries without having a diplomatic options as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, obviously, we will uh, develop a dialogue a little bit later and we come back to <coughs> some of your very profound uh, insights, look at the reality, what it is all about. Our next speaker is going to be Ambassador Kaita, formerly the ambassador <coughs> of Mali uh, in the United States, and I'm personally very grateful to him for his generosity with his time and guidance uh, in terms of developing uh, some activities uh, related, academic activities related to Africa, the African Initiative, and uh, we welcome him again to share some of his concerns about uh, the issue of diplomacy and force at this juncture, particularly when we look at the situation in uh, Africa, in the Maghreb and the Sahel, and across the continent. Uh, so we welcome your remarks now and then we'll continue with the discussion. Would you kindly come up? <coughs> okay. uh, thank you, Professor Bob Turner, uh, for that kind introduction, and thank you, Professor Jan Alexander for hosting me again at uh, this Ambassadors Forum on uh, Diplomacy and Force, Rewards, Costs, and uh, Lessons. And I would like also to thank uh, uh, Ambassador Temuru for his uh, very uh, bright uh, remarks 
Uh, I'm not going to make a comparison between um, the weight and the influence of uh, British Petroleum expert and, and IMF or the World Bank uh, expert in comparison with um, the uh, career diplomats' uh, functions and missions. Um, I'm glad uh, of the opportunity to contribute to these uh, important discussions. And in my uh, remarks uh, today, I would like to accomplish uh, two things. First, uh, I would like to share with you a bit about uh, conventional uh, diplomacy and governmental uh, diplomacy traditional tools transformation. Uh, second, I would like to uh, outline a few uh, key points about the remodeling uh, diplomacy traditional tools and adjusting uh, them to new conditions. In other words, how to faster transition uh, to the new or modern uh, form of uh, diplomacy to prevent future uh, terrorism uh, insurgencies and uh, wars. And as you said, uh, Professor Riona, um, focused on uh, the situation in uh, Africa. That's why, uh, first of all, let me begin uh, by defining the current regional security uh, threat to peace facing Africa. Briefly, this is the situation. Currently, uh, there are huge sources of instability, conflicts, and tensions in the region, and the dangers flow uh, from uh, several causes. The most important factor is the interstate conflicts which can easily take uh, on uh, a regional uh, dimension as well as international uh, terrorism and global issues uh, such as migration, water, food, and uh, the search for energy uh, sources. Over the past uh, two years, uh, complex inter inter interstate conflicts gave way to uh, large-scale uh, civil wars like in Mali, uh, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Nigeria, uh, which are themselves uh, being rapidly overtaken by smaller rebellions, terrorist groups, and uh, mid-sized insurgencies large enough to cause significant damage on uh, national and regional uh, scale. What is more, uh, the growing scale and significance of chronic organized criminal uh, violence in the Sahel region, uh, the Gulf of Guinea, and the Gulf of Aden, uh, often sustained by uh, transnational crime networks, has raised new security challenges. Poverty, ignorance, sickness, Population growth, em environmental degradation, frustration, and uh, exclusion, engendering extremism and uh, violence. These are uh, also the real threats, the causes of so many internal conflicts today. And neither traditional tools of diplomacy or preventive diplomacy, nor the imposition of peace, uh, can root them out. And while uh, the sources of insecurity in Africa are flexible and dynamic. Diplomacy tools are often inflexible and static. Before proceeding further into the discussion, it's important to highlight uh, that uh, traditional diplomacy is the art and practice of conducting negotiations between representatives of states. It usually refers to international diplomacy the conduct of international relations through the intercession of professional diplomats with regard to issues of peacemaking, trade, economics, and at times in conjunction with other means such as military action. We have also to make distinction between foreign policy and diplomacy or international diplomacy. Diplomacy has several functions such as representing the state, and conducting negotiations in order to reach agreements and draw up rules for the international uh, uh, system. It's a mode of communication, one of whose chief attributes is to avert or regulate disputes. It thus serves to uh, prevent conflicts and restore 
peace. On the other side, foreign policy involves more than the traditional tools of diplomacy and touches upon concepts such as security and embraces a much wider concept of security, the environment and human uh, rights conflict prevention also. In fact, diplomacy is an instrument in support of countries' foreign policy, which defines the objectives that diplomacy carries out and also implies in the eyes of some states uh, at least shouldering uh, responsibility at the global level. This leads me to make the point that traditional tools of diplomacy and force, uh, such as preventive diplomacy, peace enforcement and peace building, political dialogue, national reconciliation and mediation, and sustainable development have become common currency in uh, professional diplomatic circles. At this point, remodeling diplomacy tools become extremely crucial issue. A fast developing international system opened doors to many new factor, uh, actors in the area of international cooperation, including international organizations, uh, tra transnational corporations, and important uh, interest groups. It's now accessible to and performed by NGOs, as well as individuals who have one man one main characteristic, credibility. The role of the state has changed in response to the rapidly uh, changing international environment and the involvement of uh, these new actors. The result, of course, is that diplomacy has changed with it. Multilateral processes connected to security, economic, social, technological, and other changes influence the essence of modern diplomacy. In that context, the question is, I'm responding to you, your question, are the traditional tools of diplomacy and force sufficient to respond to security threats and conflicts in Africa and to prevent future terrorism insurgencies and wars? In Africa, regional bodies uh, have increasingly taken up the language of conflict prevention and uh, preventive diplomacy. The African Union, Peace and Security Council has been highly active, as have numerous uh, other associated bodies, such as the Panel of the Wise, the African Standby Force, and the Continental Early Warning System. Uh, ECOWAS uh, also played a key role in mediation efforts in uh, Guinea in 2009-2010, uh, along with the African Union and the United Nations. It's evident that uh, regionally in Africa, while significant progress has been made in recent years by the African Union, also its doctrine and rhetoric remains a long way ahead of its operational capacity, as we have seen so actually and alarmingly in CAR, South Sudan and Nigeria, much more needs to be done to strengthen conflict prevention and resolution capability. It's also evident that to date in Africa, a state-centered system has failed to pursue appropriate conflict resolution policies uh, compatible with the needs of the current conflict arena. We know even if some countries who think they have the capacity to go it alone are not, al are not always quick to admit it, is that uh, it is simply not, not possible to respond effectively to security threats, whether global or regional or in many cases even local, whether coming from state or non-state actors, aggressors or proliferators of terrorists without effective international uh, cooperation. Now we see the following changes uh, regarding the transformation of uh, traditional tools of uh, diplomacy. Ministries of Foreign Affairs has delegated some uh, 
uh, functions to other actors. The role of non-governmental actors has increased. Multilateral cooperation for me, it's become more important. The structure and functions of diplomatic institutions are redefined. The balance between generalists and specialists is redefined. The influence of information and agendas of foreign affairs is growing. Global information environment is defining the work of foreign office. Uh, the ways of communication are diversified. Innovative information technologies are uh, introduced. Fast exchange of information minimizes the importance of previously uh, planned policy. And uh, fast decisions are emphasized. Experts' role in negotiations become more important. National initiatives uh, have also proliferated. In uh, the United States, the Obama administration's national security strategy highlights the importance of preventing violent conflict, and conflict prevention has been identified as a priority for the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. The U.S. government also works on an atrocities prevention uh, board, APB, with a mandate to stop genocide level uh, violence and human rights abuses before uh, they uh, begin. Summarizing, uh, I will restrict myself to uh, highlight six points I feel are particularly important. One, uh, there are limits to any country's capacity, even the U.S., to do anything without allies, friends, or supporters, or by extension, working through international and intergovernmental institutions, starting with the UN Security Council. Two, we can say that uh, despite the development of conflict prevention mechanisms and the growing number of successes achieved by uh, preventive diplomacy, armed conflicts in Africa still occur and uh, post-war uh, normalization and uh, rehabilitation uh, require constant and active international involvement and support. Three, uh, the range of actors involved in preventive actions and conflict resolution in Africa is too diffuse and fragmented for any coordination body to step in and impose a degree of uh, order. And stakeholders uh, would rightly be concerned about the ultimate goal of coordination and the use of any information they might share. For uh, the rapid emergence of new stakeholders focused on conflict prevention and preventive uh, diplomacy has generated challenges associated with coordination and quality control. While the diversity of uh, these new players may offer uh, some exciting innovation, it also produces uh, challenges of cooperation and mutual awareness. Without better understanding uh, on uh, another's effort, uh, agencies may duplicate efforts or worse, undermine each other's attempts and generate conflict prevention fatigue. Five, uh, the transformation of traditional diplomacy happens at high level if we take three basic uh, features of diplomacy as the uh, starting uh, point, representation, negotiations, and exchange of information, we see uh, major uh, changes. Diplomatic services in the way of state administration offices and branches are uh, also subject to change. More than ever, international relations include many new important actors. Uh, traditional diplomacy cannot alone handle a vast array of new issues. For example, the environment, population terrorism, transnational crime, drugs, and sustainable development. Also, the entry of these new players has ended the effective monopoly uh, diplomats uh, once enjoyed over international relations, governmental diplomacy continues uh, to have an important role. That's why it would be wrong to say that the role of the governmental diplomacy has uh, lessened due to growing importance of non-state actors or that the role of government governmental diplomacy has declined. In fact, effective 
foreign affairs institutions are essential not only for improvement of economical and social welfare, but also for providing security. Six, and finally, it's important to mention uh, the African uh, Union Commission and African governmental uh, diplomacy's capacity to react adequately to non-traditional threats, risks, and vulnerabilities. AUC, the African Union Commission, and foreign uh, ministers and diplomats need to reinvent themselves and strengthen security in all levels of analysis. The failure of conflict management in recent years in Africa has been due in part to the relative lateness of the action uh, employed. Having said that, uh, AUC and foreign affairs institutions considering actual regional uh, threats and international issues must urgently develop a proactive role remodeling traditional methods and adjusting them to new conditions. Considering the aforementioned uh, points, I want to even argue that the role of modern diplomacy will be even more important in Africa's future than it has been during the last 30 years. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Kaita, for your uh, assessment on the nature of the threats, both horizontally and vertically, and based not only on your experience uh, related to Mali, but your uh, diplomatic service in other African uh, countries like uh, Ethiopia and Kenya and Djibouti and so forth and uh, your international work. So we'll come back to uh, many of the issues that you raised um, in terms of the role of diplomacy. Now we're going to shift and uh, to have our uh, colleagues to military uh, perspectives uh, one from Lieutenant Colonel Sebastian Simbiou, who is now the French uh, liaison officer uh, at the Joint Staff of uh, J7. And um, I'm uh, very grateful to him uh, to join us because uh, his experience uh, not only in uh, Africa and particularly uh, in, in Mali, uh, in terms of the Mali uh, crisis um, and uh, his fight against uh, the Al-Qaeda, but his uh, deployment in other countries, uh, in Africa, Gabon, Chad, and so on. But uh, also I, I'd like to mention his involvement in Afghanistan, also working with uh, NATO uh, training uh, mission and so forth. So uh, we have a true paratrooper and soldier who will share his uh, views. Would you kindly come up here? <coughs> Sharon, you have this slide? Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I feel very small <laughs> in front of such an assembly and uh, attendance, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I will uh, talk more about uh, the usage of force more than the, uh, the diplomatic part. Uh, but I think there are some uh, useful linkage, uh, linkages I, I, can, uh, I can give you. So next slide. <laughs> so uh, as you, you may know, I was in Mali uh, last, uh, last winter uh, for just two months, uh, but at the very beginning of the crisis. Uh, and uh, so I, I have a, a good, uh, I think, a good knowledge of the terrorist threat in this uh, part of Africa now uh, uh, because I have uh, uh, I've been uh, in front of them, uh, of those terrorists, and uh, uh, I, I st following the operation, I, I studied a, a, a lot about that because it was very, very interesting. So the Operation Serval, uh, was a French-led operation, but not only. It was uh, shared with different countries, and that's uh, maybe the first point where the diplomacy, where diplomacy uh, 
uh, meet uh, the, the use of force uh, because uh, we, we fought uh, alongside the Malian army at the very beginning. Uh, we reinforced the, the Malian army. We established, we helped to establish the capacities of different African armies to help to, uh, uh, to, win, to win this battle. So it, it, the, uh, the country at this time was uh, disrupt. Some, some, uh, but we, uh, because of the lo long char shared history we have with Africa and especially with Mali, uh, we couldn't uh, let this uh, happen. So uh, we face an aggressive enemy and uh, the whole operation was very challenging for France and its allies. The use of force uh, in this case uh, uh, point out the uh, expeditionary way, uh, the new expeditionary way of the, the current warfare. And uh, the, the main characteristic of this operation was a fast response uh, to uh, uh, an unexpected situation, a regional approach, we saw, uh, as I already mentioned, with different African countries, a uh, non-state and terrorist threat uh, in front of us, and the use of combined and joint forces. This is uh, an, inter uh, an internal look uh, on uh, our forces, and uh, as well, a multinational engagement with many uh, European and uh, uh, countries and uh, uh, the United States. Next slide. I would like to uh, talk a little bit more about the threat itself and the uh, jihadist armed groups in uh, this part of Africa, in this part of, of Sahara and Sahel. Not only, it's not only uh, an issue for Mali, it's an issue for the whole area. As you, c as you can see uh, on, on the map, uh, all those points are, are locations where the jihadists uh, stay. So you can see that uh, it's not only Mali, but it's uh, also Niger and uh, Libya and uh, Algeria. So there are many connections with different countries. It's not uh, really an army we, we faced during this, uh, this operation. The enemy was very co came from different uh, different uh, place in Africa with different uh, way of mind, so uh, and it's it's very difficult to uh, to use uh, diplomacy against such an enemy because uh, he, he hasn't got any uh, official uh, uh, representation, so. You have to deal with them. And to deal with them, uh, unfortunately, uh, was the use of force by, by France. And it's not only jihadists, it's uh, also smugglers. Uh, and the, the main course of action of this enemy is not to fight directly the force, uh, is to they avoid uh, to fight us when possible, when possible. So they, they prefer to hide uh, within the population, for instance, uh, uh, and they, they are able to conduct uh, op opportunistic alliances. And they can change. The friend of uh, today is not the, fri the friend of tomorrow. It's very difficult to, uh, to deal with this threat. Next slide. It's a quick uh, focus for uh, your understanding of what, what the enemy is really and how uh, this enemy fights. Uh, because uh, it, it's, it, it's not like a traditional army, it's not a confrontation uh, of, uh, of two armies. It's a, it's a confrontation of wills, but not a confrontation of two militaries. So, as you can see the, uh, in the Adrar des Iforas, so in the north, uh, northeast of, uh, of Mali, uh, they, they had a safe, a safe haven, and the, this safe haven was uh, well prepared for combat. Well prepared, and uh, we, you, we, we, we observed that the, uh, the enemy, generally speaking, and uh, uh, especially uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, leveraged 
of uh, all the former uh, wars, especially in uh, Syria, Libya, and Afghanistan. So this enemy uh, is, is stronger than, than expected, and uh, they, they are very, very hard to, uh, to fight. Next slide. Now, uh, after the enemy, I would like to, uh, to point out the French uh, 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 making decision making process and how it deal with uh, how are the uh, interactions between the military the and the, the political level. So our chief of defense uh, is the military advisor of the government. So he can advise him about the situation from a military point of view. Uh, as well as this, uh, the French uh, Department of State uh, uh, does with the, with the president. And the president in France can uh, decide by uh, himself uh, the opportunity or not to, uh, to, uh, to intervene in a country. Uh, and after that, he, ge he, he gives the uh, operational command to the uh, chief of defense. So it's a very short loop to make the decision to intervene uh, in a country. What I would like to, uh, to remind as well is that we cannot and we, 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 doesn't, we don't want to intervene without uh, um, uh, an international and legal mandate. So uh, when the French uh, president decide to to, uh, decided to, uh, to intervene, uh, he, he made sure before that, uh, to have uh, a request from the Malian uh, government. That's the first point. And the second point is that he made sure that the UN, uh, the United Nations, uh, gave him a clearance to, uh, to, inter to intervene. So it's very important to keep that in mind. This is our uh, decision making process with a loop, but you need the legal environment. To, uh, to commit the troop in the country. Next slide. Just a reminder, no, it's more, more the story of the, of the conflict, but uh, I, I would like to, to remind uh, that when you use force, it's, it, could, it could be very uh, challenging. Uh, this part of Mali, so the north, the north part of Mali, uh, is uh, roughly the size of France or the size of Texas for, for US people. So it's a huge country, uh, uh, empty for the most part, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not that empty. <laughs> many, many people live in, in the area, uh, mostly they are Tuareg, uh, but uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in an area uh, of this size, uh, this size uh, it's very difficult to conduct the campaign. And given the uh, emergency, uh, we, we conducted the campaign, uh, and at the same time, we built the force, and we planned the future. And the future for us was not a French future, but a Malian future, and an African future. Uh, so um, the most part of the plan was to keep the threat at the lowest level possible, uh, while increasing the uh, capacities uh, of our partners, and mainly African, to make sure the uh, Malian armed forces are able to will be able to deal with the threat in the future with the, uh, the help of um, uh, their neighbors. Next slide. Next. I, 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 won't, I won't go into the detail of the operations. It's not, it's not the case right now. Uh, the lessons uh, we learned and uh, confirmed for and uh, confirmed from Fr for France, uh, and uh, this is another uh, touch point with the diplomacy. But when uh, you, uh, a government uh, chose to uh, chose to chooses to uh, to um, uh, to commit some troops in a in a war, the troops need a clear initial political end state and a mission statement. Uh, as clear as possible. 
and that uh, and we 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 add that at the beginning uh, in uh, in Mali and it f for us uh, it uh, it uh, uh, it was easy to uh, to conduct the campaign as uh, you may know France has many troops uh, pre-deployed in uh, different countries in Africa and. Uh, for us, uh, it's uh, really valuable because we have a good knowledge of the environment and uh, the French armed forces currently have a, an expeditionary mentality. We have as well uh, a quick reaction force and this uh, syst uh, alert system was uh, very helpful uh, during, the, during the war. We learned a lot of lessons from our uh, war in Libya in 2011 and in Afghanistan uh, as well for tactics, techniques and uh, equipment. I think France has a good expertise in, uh, in terms of cooperation uh, with African countries and uh, uh, it allowed us to, uh, to fight efficiently at, uh, from the beginning of the operation. And if you want to conduct a war, you must be prepared to uh, use not only the high technology we, uh, we add now and we, we discuss uh, that uh, uh, prior, but uh, if you want to fight some terrorist, you need to uh, use old fashioned uh, dismounted uh, uh, search. You, you must go by foot on the ground. No, there is no other way but to do that. Next slide. And uh, I think there are some challenges ahead for the force right now. You know that France uh, has decreased the, uh, its troops in, uh, in the operation, but we need to keep the situation under control and to, uh, 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 in order to, uh, uh, to, make, to make the dialogue, the political dialogue between North and South part of Mali possible. France now plan and operate with the minus May and uh, France help to keep off the jihadist group and uh, if possible to kill and disband those groups. And I think this is the case now. Uh, France with the neighbors of Mali uh, is expanding the, uh, the hunt for uh, the jihadist group because they, uh, they don't know the borders. Next slide. So, as a conclusion, uh, I, uh, I would say that the keys for success are a unity of purpose at uh, all levels and uh, starting from the political level down to the uh, soldier, uh, soldier level. Uh, the ability to operate on short notice for, uh, for a, a country if you want to, uh, to, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be strong uh, you, you, you need to have a, a good backup and a, a quick backup. High readiness, uh, high readiness uh, force uh, are uh, allowed by your permanent station force in Africa, uh, forces in Africa, and we need as well to have a good a very high level of interoperability and confidence with multinational partners, Africa and with our uh, European and uh, Amer North American uh, partners. And it's very important to, uh, it's not only a matter of a military, uh, it's a matter of a, 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 a negotiation at uh, all, uh, all levels, uh, including the political levels. That concludes my briefing, and uh, I know that the questions are for uh, later. <laughs> Thank you very much. We certainly should uh, salute you for the uh, success in neutralizing the uh, Al-Qaeda and the Al-Qaeda affiliates in, uh, in Mali and uh, learn uh, the lessons, uh, particularly the quick response, um, I think, force uh, missions that are already increasing. Now, another 
um, view perspective on the military. I am I'm very uh, pleased and honored to introduce uh, retired Colonel uh, T. Murphy. I'm grateful to him for his uh, professionalism and guidance uh, related to the role of the military. And uh, he, uh, if I may mention, a true pilot. Um, so we can learn a great deal uh, from the experience of the Air Force. And he also served uh, diplomatically uh, military attaché at the American uh, Embassy in Tel Aviv um, and uh, so forth. And he worked with State Department and uh, also was uh, deployed in uh, in Korea and uh, Germany and uh, Japan. So from your perspective, um, we would welcome your remarks. Please come up here. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. It's uh, <coughs> a great privilege for me to be here this morning and to, or this afternoon, and. Uh, uh, share a few thoughts with you. I would like to um, uh, follow a bit in the footsteps of uh, the distinguished ambassadors Yakabashvili and uh, Kaita this morning uh, or this afternoon to talk about um, how the world has changed and what that means. In my view, that it needs to uh, that we need to change in in the way we approach the problem from the military perspective as they. Uh, talked about the diplomatic uh, perspective. It, the world is indeed uh, a much different place than I, when I grew up as a young uh, man in the, in the United States Air Force. It seems to me that um, uh, what distinguishes this century and, and uh, the latter half of last century from the, the recent past is the, the explosion of, of um, adversaries and the and the types of adversaries that we need to deal with uh, from a political uh, military and political point of view so uh, still of course we have the problem of nation states that are in conflict with each other uh, but we also are seeing the the need to to um, uh, deal with conflict between a nation state and a very well organized subnational groups sometimes that are even have legal status within another nation state or another system uh, and then of course the step down from that you have uh, outlawed but very organized and and uh, violent groups that we normally place in the category of terrorist uh, groups and then at the bottom you have just kind of loosely organized but very very violent uh, groups and and all of the sudden, from a military and a diplomatic point of view, we're having to deal with this whole uh, range of, uh, of uh, bad options, if you will. Uh, you know, you can pick up the newspaper this morning, you can find uh, examples of all four of these uh, categories. The, um, uh, you know, lots and lots of tension, even today as we speak, between Vietnam and China that, that fall within the traditional uh, nation state um, uh, purview or, or construct that uh, w that we knew well in the 19th and early early 20th century. Um, Ukraine, in my view, is is facing the same thing or a little bit of a hybrid of it. Um, uh, there there's a very thin disguise of the subnational group that really is, in my view, a, a thin disguise of of the forces of a nation state uh, next door to a Ukraine that. Uh, is uh, involved in that, uh, in the conflict with that um, uh, country. I, I think uh, uh, Hezbollah on the northern border of, of Israel is the best example of a, a subnational group that actually has a, a legal status in, in another country, and yet Israel is having to deal with them not as they would deal with in the same way that they would deal with Lebanon, the nation state, but, but uh, that subnational group them, themselves. Very well armed, very well organized, and actually hold uh, a position as a legal party within that uh, nation. And then, of course, all the many faces of Al Qaeda, we talked about AQIM this morning, um, are good examples of the third level of group that are, are quite organized, quite violent, uh, but don't fall within. Uh, the nation state and normally within the nation state that they uh, 
have other than uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan many years ago. They, they are an outlawed group uh, within that nation state. Um, you know, we could, we could talk about this and the, dis the distinguished ambassador from Nigeria is gone, so, um, so he can't correct me, I guess. But I see Boko Haram as, as sort of in the, in the transition from the loosely organized, very violent group up, you know, up a step into, into a more organized uh, um, group that actually is, is, uh, is um, becoming more organized and more violent and more um, uh, uh, dangerous to, uh, to Nigeria. Um, you, you know, I, I say that this is new, and it's really not new. It, uh, you know, it started back in the latter part of the 20th century, as we see this um, this movement from uh, uh, primarily nation state on nation state to other things. I I, uh, I have to be careful of this, but I I, I would uh, um, estimate, and I'd have to go back and get the data. Uh, to be right, but in General Gray's uh, career, probably more U.S. United States Marines were killed by the forces of a subnational group than were killed by the forces of another of another nation. And so, you know, we're in that world where where this is a growing issue and a growing uh, problem uh, to us. Um, we in in my early days, we used to call this low intensity conflict until the people that were involved in it started coming to the Pentagon and everything and and uh, I've never met a single person that was in the middle of it that called it low intensity conflict because when you're you're in the middle of it it is not low intensity um, so we've changed our language as we work through that I, in 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 dealing with it from a military point of view I, I really do think there is is a uh, some uh, there are some gaps in our in our thinking. Uh, and certainly in some of the literature, in, in my view, and, and two of the gaps that I think are, are particularly important from my point of view, and the first is a, a gap in understanding and really how to understand the political goals of the, of the subnational groups that we are dealing with. You know, Clausewitz's famous uh, dictum, as he said it was, we see, therefore, that war is not merely an act of policy, but a true political instrument, a continuation of political intercourse uh, carried out with other means. Now, I, I agree with uh, Professor uh, Turner that um, Sun Tzu still applies. I think Clausewitz still applies uh, when, as we're working through um, uh, different organizations and different ways of, of doing battle. Now, Clausewitz was talking about 18th and 19th century nation-on-nation -nation war, but I really do think that that it's quite true even w even within these subnational groups. Um, what the, the casual student of Clausewitz would miss was actually in that same paragraph. Uh, he said, the political object is the goal of war. Uh, 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 the political object is the goal. War is the means of reaching it. And means can never be considered in isolation from the purpose. So we want to look at both the means and the goal. And I, I do think this applies, and I think we need to do a little bit more uh, thinking on this in the it, when we're facing the forces of uh, subnational uh, people, we see it through a glass very darkly about what the political object is uh, for some of these groups and how to uh, how best to oppose that or prevent that political object. So I think the the best and most efficient ways to to uh, counter violence across the spectrum is really to begin to understand. Uh, better the political goals and what what is the combination of diplomatic e economic and, and um, uh, military power that we can apply against um, some of these groups that will that will meet our goals and and uh, prevent them from from reaching theirs we um, this is one of the reasons that I uh, personally am not enamored with over generalized uh, descriptions of the enemy the war on terror or uh, Islamic terrorism, uh, because in every case, we're dealing with a particular group that has a particular set of, of uh, objectives and political objectives. And if we, if we generalize too much in naming the threat that we're facing, then we tend to generalize a way to where we, where we uh, can't, or it's more difficult to understand particularly what the political goal is that, they're, uh, uh, that they uh, seek. 
Um, now, that's not simple, as Colonel Shinabo, you know, put up that whole list of jihadists that all came together. I'm not saying that it's a simple uh, issue of trying to really figure out what, you know, what it is they want to achieve and how I best can prevent them from achieving it, but we do need to think in that way, in my view. Uh, the second gap, I think, is similar to the first, um, and that's we have, uh, we need a better understanding of the combination and the efficacy of uh, the true tools of power, diplomatic, economic, and political, all the way through this spectrum of, of um, uh, uh, different, I, different uh, organized, from loosely organized to organized and, and dangerous to highly organized and actually legal subnational group up to the point of a nation state that might even be a state uh, sponsor of terrorism or what do we call it. We're, we are fond of saying uh, we don't negotiate with terrorists and um, uh, you know that's a that's a nice tagline, but it doesn't. It's not really a good substitute for strategy. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. Hey, you know we should stop all this and start negotiating with terrorists. What I am saying is, if you if you just follow the tagline uh, to its logical conclusion, the only choice we have is to is to send forces and start start fighting. And I think in our world, our our choices really are are much broader than that. And we. Um, should think through them. I, uh, Professor Turner mentioned uh, deterrence this morning, and I, I grew up with Thomas Schelling and and uh, <laughs> some of that crowd. Maybe some of you are old enough to re remember that too. But you know, deterrence theory in the nuclear world was really, really very developed game theory and all that kind of a thing. Well, you know, what wh why are we doing the same thing at some of these subnational groups to talk about really? Can they be deterred? If they can't be deterred, how, what are the best ways to deter them? Uh, and you know, if I have to fight, what's the, what's the right combination of, of military power and alliances and attacking their alliances and those kinds of things? Um, uh, more examples of uh, that that I could uh, deal with in question and answer if you want to. In, in, in closing, I, I would just like to say that um, you know, the world's likely to uh, remain very fractured and violent uh, through, the, through this part, at least, of the 21st uh, century with conflict across this whole range of, of uh, groups. And uh, I agree with the distinguished ambassadors that, that from the military point of view, like we need new thinking about diplomacy and the institutions of how we do this world, in the same way we need some new uh, thinking about how we handle the the military side of this uh, equation, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch it, uh, watch it go. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to make a few comments and share my thoughts. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, theme, uh, you know, is a old academic. Um, you you triggered a lot of. Uh, thinking about the uh, teaching of uh, the strategies I mentioned, uh, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz. Uh, we, we have a long, long, long list of uh, others uh, to learn from. Um, if I mentioned the uh, Machiavelli <laughs> and uh, Ops, uh, War Against War, all, all of this, but um, uh, again, in terms of the contemporary I, I think uh, teachers, uh, you mentioned uh, Tom Schelling, and um, obviously uh, there are some others. I, I had the uh, privilege of being a student uh, of Schelling, and then uh, Sam Huntington and Hans Morgenthau on one side <laughs> at Columbia and Chicago, and then Philip Jessup and Quincy Wright on the other side in terms of the role of diplomacy and international law. At any rate, that's just a little academic footnote. Um, what I would like to do, we do have very distinguished people in the uh, audience. Maybe we'll open up a little discussion and then we'll come back to the panelists. Um, obviously, John Gray always has a special, I think, position to uh, teach us uh, as always and um, whenever you would like to speak or wait or whatever or make some comments. But let me begin first uh, over there, right.
Dr. Kumar, okay. Um, Speak loudly, please. Sure. Uh, uh, thanks a lot to, to Yona and uh, General Gray and all the great panelists, the two ambassadors and the two military officials. Um, uh, we've, been, we've been reading a lot about the use of, uh, of targeted financial sanctions and sectoral sanctions in the Ukraine crisis against Russia and Russian entities and individuals, as well as the lack uh, of, of prompt action by the U.S. State Department in designating Boko Haram early on in, in 2010, 2011, when it had started uh, looking menacing. Um, so that's uh, the use of smart power, uh, financial sanctions targeted, uh, as well as sectoral. Um, what would uh, the panelists feel about the, the effectiveness of implementation, as well as the impact of these tools? A and do they need to uh, be backed by the use of force? There is a thinking among certain circles that the sanctions against Iran have really brought it to its knees and prompted it to sit down on the negotiating table. So do, do, um, do the sanctions or other financial tools like that help in, in negotiation? And should they be backed by financial force, uh, by, by, by military force as well? Thanks. I cannot talk about Boko Haram. I'm just a spectator as you are and get news from uh, media. But I know more about Ukraine and Russia. Um, instead of talks about sanctions, probably it will be better to have sanctions and not this peerish, uh, you know, 15 men banned to travel that never travel kind of things. Uh, yes, economic sanctions are very solid instrument. Uh, yes, they can be very effective in case of Russian Federation. Let's not forget that we are dealing with a different sort of adversary. It's not the South Co North Korean regime. It's not even Iranian regime. I mean, these guys have villas and bank accounts and families in the West. And I was reading this morning something <laughs> very funny, actually. You know that Foreign Minister Lavrov has his son in America. He's an American citizen. <laughs> and uh, those who are under sanctions, uh, their wives are here. Their kids are in Columbia and other universities. You know, uh, Medvedev's son is in uh, MIT. Okay? So these are people who want to have their own way and harass the international law, but want to have all the benefits of the Western white lifestyle. They want to have a villas uh, uh, in uh, Cote d'Azur. They want to drive uh, in Maseratis, uh, but they don't want to obey the Western rules. So if you that have that kind of leadership, obviously economic sanctions are going to bring a very serious results. Now, in the same time, because they are so integrated, you have also so much reluctance from a number of countries, especially in Europe, to sanction them because they're benefiting enormously. You know, uh, Siemens, uh, the German company Siemens, that's uh, president or chairman, or whatever it's called, said, no sanctions, we are making a lot of money. Who cares about Ukrainians? And that's a kind of a duality of the situation. But if the governments will be serious about imposing sanctions, and as we all know, in sanctions, there are two important things. First is not only to declare it, but to enforce it, and to be very persistent. So you can, sanctions on only work if you are persistent. If you cannot say that, you know, okay, let me have two, three, five loopholes here and there, and I'll change my mind tomorrow. It's not going to work. And uh, I think it can be very effective. Nobody is talking about, I would personally prefer NATO troops in Ukraine. I think it would make a very serious impression on Russia. But I can tell you my own story. Uh, Russian forces were advancing toward my capital. Only thing that stopped them was that Americans declared they're putting their military air bases in Injirlik, uh, in Turkey, and uh, in Romania on alert and dispatched uh, a military ship from Sixth Fleet 
toward the Black Sea to provide humanitarian aid to Georgia. Nobody knew what was the humanitarian aid. You don't specify. In the end of the day, they brought drinking water, which we have plenty ourselves. <laughs> but uh, uh, the perception, again, that Americans are getting serious stop them. And there are so many other ways, and militaries are more qualified to talk about it, uh, to uh, prevent military actions by helping Ukrainians not with these, uh, how you call it, this MREs, yes, you know, meals, but probably it's better to give them a communication tools. They have weapons, they don't need <laughs> weapons, they're ready to fight. Probably you should provide some intel, probably you should dispatch to who are the Russian spooks in among their law enforcement agencies, and there are millions of things, and not uh, necessarily troops on the ground. So if you want to be serious, you know how to do it. You have plenty of talented people in this country, in the government, but there should be a political will to do it, and not only by the US, by what we call the West together. Uh, I think that you should have three parts. A, it should be um, uh, Russia and Russians themselves. B, companies that operate in Crimea and in other occupied territories. And C, former regime of Ukraine that have stolen $100 billion. And this is money that can, part of it at least, can be very wisely used by the new government. And there we are talking about uh, loans from the World Bank. I mean, if you will retreat part of this money, they don't need any loans anymore. It's not that there is lack of money, but the money is in the wrong hands in wrong places. I'm not naive. I'm not thinking that you can retreat 100% of it, but you know, 20% probably will be nice. But it can act as a punishment and as a deterrent. So if you had to invade Saddam in order him to revert his decision, I mean, not even actually Saddam, you in, uh, the military confrontation was in uh, Kuwait, but uh, you have to avert those kind of things. If you allow that to happen, then you will not only have China uh, and Vietnam, but you'll have much more. And look at American allies worldwide. They are all freaking out. Israelis, Saudis, they became a best friend suddenly. Why? Because they, their perception of America has changed. Koreans, Japanese, Filipinos, you know, many European countries. That's a bad news for them. So if you declare the sanctions, you better enforce them or not talk about it. They say, you know what, I don't care. That would be fair and more understandable than I'm going to impose sanction, I'm going to impose sanction soon, and you will see I will do it. Oh, I'm goddamn serious about it. You know these sanctions will be so horrible. Don't you guys understand that sanctions are bad? Wait, stop talking. Start acting. You know? Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, if I could just add one comment to the to the um, uh, the question about uh, uh, designating Boko Haram as a as a uh, terrorist organization, that that is, uh, I think, a good example of how we need to go to the next level of our thinking. Um, so I, I don't have any first-hand knowledge of whether that uh, is true or not, and let's just accept it as true for, na for now that we didn't want to do that because it would bring additional uh, uh, attention to Boko Haram and we didn't want to do that. Um, is that true or not true? You know, how does, how does the designation of someone as a terrorist organization, which is really a political uh, act or a diplomatic act, how, how does that impact? Does it work or not? The, yeah. uh, on the other piece of that is the EU who declared uh, the political or the military wing of Hezbollah a terrorist organization but not the political wing, building a distinction that even Hezbollah doesn't recognize. Um, and, and because they're, they're trying to walk a tightrope there. So those are the kinds of things that, that I really think we need to think 
more deeply about. That's a step. Is it a good step? Is it a bad step? What works? What doesn't? Uh, and going back to what I said, uh, this yeah, is. Uh, um, uh. Yes, Ambassador Zango, you mentioned the Bakur Haram. Would you, would you like, or you have the mic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the issue ha has been addressed here, really. We need to really critically look at uh, the uh, if you like the modalities, the rules of the game that we have designated. And I think the panelists did a wonderful job by saying that the kind of rules, the kind of templates we use today uh, do not address the key issues. Uh, the Boko Haram issue, uh, I'm very familiar with it. There was reluctance on both sides uh, from the Department of State and even from Nigeria uh, for good reasons. Uh, like you rightly observe, not to give Boko Haram the kind of recognition it deserves at the international level. But at the same time also, that also gave it plenty of time to commit so much atrocities, uh, to build capacity, to extend its uh, horrific uh, operations uh, there. So uh, I think that should be something to ponder over and then see whether these rules really work uh, today. Uh, in essence, I think the key issue is to look at the thin line dividing diplomacy and force and see whether there is a commonality of purpose. I think the key issue that we need to look at, uh, like uh, Ambassador Tenuri mentioned, is uh, really to begin to address, uh, bring new templates if we want to do something, let's do it. Uh, uh, the U.S. today is perceived as very slow in responding to key issues of uh, using, uh, addressing humanitarian and crisis issues. That is a perception in Africa, rightly or wrongly. Uh, the French is, on the other hand, being commended for uh, rapid response uh, for whatever reason. So somehow we must now begin to uh, set Com templates that uh, deal with this and are accepted uh, internationally. In other words, now we begin to, we must begin to create new systems of international cooperation uh, in addressing conflict, in addressing many of these issues, even the issues of sanctions. How do we deal with uh, renegade states, uh, or bad governance, bad leadership? All these are really the main issues. Really, uh, more often than not, we are reacting rather than being proactive. We must begin to address the issues, the underlying causes of some of these insurgencies before they do occur. Uh, instead of saying, uh, let's have a response mechanism in dealing with them. If we address the issue preventing them from emerging, 50% uh, of the job would have been done. I think that is the key issue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Craig Childers, for those, those that don't know me. Uh, I, I think, um, to, to follow up on what the ambassador said, uh, Professor Turner hit it early in his remarks about uh, the connection between military force and diplomacy and politics, and, and it's, cla it's classical Clausewitz. And uh, as, a, as a former soldier myself, I I can see the soldier scholar piece of this that says, what is, the, what is the political end that the use of force serves? And one of the things that uh, Colonel Shinobo Sh Sh uh, hit a couple of times in his presentation was that all the way from the president to the, the trooper on the ground, we understood this is the end state desired. So the troops understand what it is the president wants done, and the French are to be commended, and I, and I absolutely agree, that uh, they didn't hesitate. They got whatever um, uh, international advisory, whatever's that, uh, that they felt they needed, and acted. Um, went in, got on the ground, completed the mission, left, and then said, but oh, by the by, we reserve the right to come back any time at our discretion, not yours. Um, 
So I would be interested to hear from the, the panelists. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this whole idea of the uh, uh, warfare and diplomacy being the two sides of the same coin? We have also a representative from Jordan. Chairman, would you give him please? Well, thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you, the panelists here. I have just uh, first one comment when it comes for, let us say, if the U.S. or the international community want to use force in, 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 in Ukraine or in any country. Uh, we, have, we have seen what happened in Iraq. I mean, it's true that we've got rid from, from Saddam Hussein, but the consequences of, of the invasion or of the war there, we are still see, seeing it, it uh, there until now. There is no... Uh, powerful Iraqi institutions. The terrorists are there. They are on our borders. They are in Syria, inside Syria. They are on the Israeli borders. So there are a very uh, dangerous consequences sometimes when you go on when you seek for military uh, intervention. So my question is how can we deal on the after, in the after of using uh, military uh, interve uh, intervention? And another question, if you allow me, when it comes for the economic sanctions, uh, I don't know exactly how it, um, what, is the, what is the amount of trade between Russia and the U.S. Because, uh, I mean, what will be, what, uh, how beneficial will, will uh, imposing sanctions, for instance, on Russia will be, will be uh, beneficial for, for the international community. Um, as far as I know that if you want to impose international sanction, sanctions, you'll have to go for the, for the Security Council. So how you're going to do that uh, with, with the, of course, with the Russian veto? Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Kaiser, thank you. Thank you. We we'll have a, a short response. Uh, obviously, it deserves much greater attention. And, you know, we are bound by the ac academic clock. So we will continue the dialogue, but at least short responses. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. I will try to respond very briefly um, to uh, the three questions. Uh, the first one about uh, um, about uh, the uh, economic sanctions. The in fact, um, uh, economic sanctions uh, imposed on states it's uh, different than this kind of. Uh, sanctions uh, imposed on uh, armed and uh, terrorist groups. Uh, we appreciated last week this uh, uh, the UN Security Council uh, decision to impose sanctions on Boko Haram, and uh, before that, uh, there were other uh, sanctions uh, to Hezbollah, to other uh, armed and Islamic groups. Um, uh, here, the difference uh, on the side of uh, 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 Boko Haram terrorist groups is that it has as goal to, 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 to freeze the financial resources of, this, uh, of these groups and to limit the movement of their leaders uh, and fighters and ultimately uh, to prepare the, to bring these people uh, to justice. Uh, so, uh, but here for the case of uh, Boko Haram, uh, I think it's uh, uh, more complex uh, than the other uh, armed groups like Hezbollah, mm -hmm. like uh, maybe the Muslim Brotherhood or uh, other terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, with its uh, affiliations. Uh, um, uh, 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 Boko Haram, uh, uh, it's uh, an affiliate group to uh, Al Qaeda, but uh, the the channels of its founding are not uh, very clear. Maybe we can impose sanctions on Shawako or its other uh, fighters, but it will be uh, very complex uh, to freeze the founding of them. But it, the problem is still uh, remain uh, there because. 
um, the, as you followed the last week, this, uh, there is still so sources of financement and finding founding of uh, this uh, Boko Haram uh, through uh, kidnapping of girls, uh, kidnapping of Europeans or uh, other people, and trafficking uh, trafficking of drugs. So uh, it's very uh, appreciable this kind of uh, sanctions uh, against the terrorist groups, but. Uh, we have to reinforce them and to assure uh, a real coordination uh, for the international actors uh, to uh, impose them. Uh, uh, on the other side, the, um, uh, the political end of uh, military intervention, uh, this is clear when uh, a conflict is spreading and is going uh, to uh, a large scale uh, violence in, uh, in any region, uh, this uh, push the uh, international actors to uh, to go to war against it. This is what France uh, did in Mali, and uh, for the same reason, France intervened also in uh, Central African uh, Republic to stop uh, violence and to bring all um, uh, people concerned about it to uh, the people starting negotiation, uh, starting again the uh, other, uh, uh, the implementation of other diplomacy tools, traditional tools, uh, the mediation, national reconciliation. It's very complicated in CER because it's not only a problem of fighting within groups, but we have also this question of uh, uh, religious radicalism, and uh, this is a very extremely uh, important. But if it's necessary, military intervention is uh, always uh, welcome to bring things uh, on the ground and to push people to come uh, back to uh, to the table of uh, of negotiation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants on this point? Yeah. Let's, uh, this Maybe just one comment about the, the coin uh, uh, picture. Uh, I, I, I would say it's not a coin, uh, it would be more a three faces uh, picture. With uh, one face is diplomacy, second face is the military, the use of, the use of force, and maybe the, the third one now should be the economic, the economic part. And uh, uh, the military uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't lead the uh, economic part. We 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 are used to say the development is part of the um, uh, uh, the global uh, global combat, but no, it belongs more to uh, the uh, mini both mini um, both uh, diplomacy and ministry of economy. So I, I s uh, and with the uh, uh, approval of the president. So I, I see three faces. Maybe it's just for food for thought and. Uh, uh, just another another thought I think we we could uh, consider it's the 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 time when we we must use the use force and uh, I think in Mali we we were in the good tempo just uh, uh, thanks to the uh, the attack from north because we 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 made the decision because of that but maybe in uh, in uh, Central Africa we were late so Maybe diplomacy should advise and uh, and feel when uh, the use of force is uh, is necessary. This is another another thing, and I, I I think it's very important because in Central Africa may, may, maybe we we won't achieve our goals. Um, uh, I unfortunately I have to leave, so I'll be shortly trying to answering your questions, and I'll leave. Um, we have to make very significant distinctions. Diplomacy, military are tools, as well as economic uh, the capacity, as well as, uh, I don't know, mass memorizing physically. <laughs> I don't know, whatever is there, these are tools. By themselves, tools do not do anything if somebody is not using them. So. It's not up to diplomacy or it's up uh, to military, but it's up to decision makers who make certain decisions and then they are employing this tool or that tool. So they may employ diplomacy, they may employ 
uh, economic uh, tools, they may employ uh, military tools or whatever. So these are tools. Main flaws of policy making, what I have seen, is not a, a something is wrong with diplomacy or the military, but attributing to I either of them the wrong missions. Like to diplomacy to prevent conflict when it's impreventable if you don't have a hard power next to it, or relying only on the uh, you know the militaries without diplomacy, or giving to militaries the wrong mission, like policing. Okay? You have uh, guys who are trained to kill. Let's be very simple. <laughs> okay? So you want them to build schools? I mean, probably it's not really their job. Uh, I mean, very frankly speaking. Yeah. I mean, you, they can build schools if they want to, or they, they can. Ideologically, <laughs> they have no problem with it if it's a U.S. military. But this is a different tool. Second problem. It's not that hard to remove regime. We've learned it. The problem is what comes next. And it's not only in the case of military interventions, like in Saddam Hussein case. What about Arab Springs? Look what are the results of Arab Springs now. We have better governance. Probably we have a failing states more than we used to, be, used to have. So. That's not the job of diplomats or the militaries to create the alternative governance on those places where you are intervening this way or other way. And creating that alternative is a completely different task. And it's neither diplomacy or uh, you know, the militaries can do it. It's a, other people should do it. I don't know, USAID or Department of State, some specific divisions probably, but that should be the vision of the politicians and the political decision makers that if we are going to do something, then what is the alternative that we are seeking? And who are those that are going to create the alternative? And I'm a strong believer that there is no democracy without Democrats. You need to have a people who are, who are Democrats, not the party, Democratic Party, but <laughs> believing in that. Otherwise, you will not have any de democracy on sanctions, and I have to go. Sanctions are very simple. Only one example. You know, withdrawal of Visa and MasterCard from the Russian market can inflict such a huge damage, and whoever invented it was a genius. Because you cannot interact. I mean, look what happened in Iraq, uh, in Iranian case. Was it really effective to ban them selling oil? No. What was most effective is depriving them to financial markets. That's it. Guess who has a financial market, <laughs> you know? And, and that's very simple. You don't need, really need to be super sophisticated. I mean, Russian companies owe more than they worth now already, okay? If they will not have a possibility to restructure their loans, they'll go back to Putin and say, either you give me money or you are out. And then we will see who's going to win. How Soviet Union collapsed? Because of economic sanctions, because of the malfunctioning uh, economy. So again, these tools should be employed prior to employing, obviously, you know, hard power tools. But you cannot say that I'm only employing this, and I'm sending the Hollywood movies, and I'm bringing their kids here. It's not working. And one last problem, you are losing, we are losing information warfare. Russian propaganda or this, any evil propagandas are everywhere and we do nothing. They're brainwashing their own populations, they're brainwashing anybody else, brainwashing us, Russia today. Uh, and all lunacy you can imagine is there and we are doing nothing. Thank you. I really need to. I know you have to leave, but uh, <laughs> Bob, uh, let's. I need, I need about 20 seconds. Okay. Amen. Absolutely superb presentations and superb questions. I particularly like your question. A lot of things I could say about it, but there's somebody here that's going to be far more profound. So, one, I want to thank uh, Yona and all of his crew for the fantastic job they've done here. And then I'd like to call on Al Gray 
to to say the final words and, uh, and give us some true wisdom. Why well, be here all of a sudden? That's the first time I ever heard you quit early. I, I just want to. Smarter now. I turned yeah, 70. Yeah, I want to echo what uh, Bob said. Uh, great uh, presentation, great questions. I, I do have a few uh, thoughts. We were really, you're talking about an overall aggregate strategy for the future. And, uh, and strategy involves more than just diplomacy and military. There are other elements of national and international power and influence that have to be considered. Uh, economic is a major part of that, and of course it's crucial today given globalization, given the interactions around the world and the like. Uh, political uh, power and political influence and all is, uh, is essential. Uh, some people uh, say technology is power and influence as well, and uh, but I would remind her, and that's true. But I think uh, from the military standpoint, technology is uh, still around, really, to make the uh, the war fighter and the peacekeeper more effective, and uh, so that's uh, an important consideration. We also need to learn much more about the Moors, the cultures, the languages, and the people that we're trying to help around the world. We don't do this very well in America and in some of the other more advanced countries. I remember uh, uh, one of the many times I was put on report uh, as a young officer in 1956. Uh, well, I had come back from overseas, and I was involved in... Uh, in determining uh, inter alia the number of linguists that we needed uh, in the Marine Corps for the future to participate in interrogation, translation, signal intelligence, and all the other aspects of uh, language requirements. And I was, uh, I, I looked all around the world, and I looked at the encyclopedias, and I looked at other uh, data and so on, and I was, uh, I was brief in the uh, the Commandant uh, General Shoup at the time, the famous hero of Tarawa, who was a no-nonsense uh, leader in his own right, and I was, uh, I was talking about Central Africa, and particularly the, uh, the former Congo, and I was justifying the needs for uh, Flemish linguists. And he said, what in the hell do we need Flemish linguists for? And I said, because of the Belgian influence in the Congo way back when. And he growled at me and threw me out, but uh, we, he got over it. And so the point I want to make is that uh, we don't do this kind of thing very, very well. And, and, and we, uh, you were briefed uh, very brilliantly, really, when you were talking about end state and all that kind of thing. And you mentioned that. End state really is the centerpiece of a campaign plan. And an end state really means what the hell do you want to look like when you get done, whether it's two months, two years, or two decades, for that matter. And end states are going to have to be variable and change a little bit because we have to be adaptive, and we're not very good at that either. Uh, the United States and the other uh, uh, really uh, developed nations of the world, you know, we're, we're world leaders whether we like it or not. And we've got to get in there and lead. And right now, uh, around the world, there's a lot of people doubting whether the United States is really a leader and is going to be a leader again. Uh, well, they don't have to doubt it because it's going to happen and we're going to be it. And, and we're, going to, we're going to do it. We'll get back to doing what we have to do. The, uh, in nuclear planning, uh, when I was a Joint Chief and before, I was particularly uh, interested in that aspect, and you'll recall this as well, because uh, there, were, there were certain things that were considered unacceptable acts. There were other acts that were acceptable, not good, and et cetera, et cetera, but, uh, but you could live with them. And we have to get back to that idea. We need to understand what unacceptable acts are and what we're going to do about it in the future. Uh, we have to obviously work together with other nations and stuff like that, and we have to uh, and, and we have to do whatever must be done. I mean, if you if your if your job is to uh, to um, you know have combat and this and that and get a successful uh, uh, decision, that's fine. If it's to build nations and do this, then you do that too. You do whatever must be done. And I don't. I think we uh, we kind of try to we 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 get too narrow sometimes in our focus. The idea is to do what uh, what must be done regardless of the situation. I think that uh, we overplay uh, this terrorist business. Terrorism, as I've said many times in these forums, terrorism is a tactic. 
and and there's no such thing as a war on terrorism and all that kind of that's that's ludicrous kind of thinking it's a tactic and it's used by uh, it's been used uh, you can find in the torah the quran or the bible and uh, and uh, one of the best uh, quote terrorist tactics ever dreamed up was in the Carolinas during the Revolutionary War with the Swamp Fox, with Marion and the others, and what they did in the hills of North Carolina. Uh, that was terrorism of the finest degree against the British, and uh, and they got beat because of it. So uh, we need to understand what this is all about. And the media has got to stop praising all this and, and giving them all this attention. That's what they do. They, they love that attention and all that. So we've got a lot of things to work about, a lot of things to think about, and we could talk really all day and all night about this, but everybody's saying quit now so we can get the hell out of here. <laughs> Thanks again, and uh, and uh, come back next time we have one. We'll continue this uh, dialogue. If I may, uh, General, to give each one one of your books here. Thank you uh, very much for coming. And uh, we'll keep in touch, and we'll invite you to our other seminars and dialogues. Thank you very much. Thank you.